Hey everyone, this is the uh, Nips and Sips podcast uh, featuring me. I'm Dr. Jeremy Boyd, my partner in crime over there, Dr. Brandon Cruz. Today we're going to be talking about uh, tennis elbow or better known as in the PT world, lateral epicondalgia, or some people still believe it's lateral epicondylitis. Uh, but before I get too much into that, let me pass it off back to Brandon. How's it going, my man? Going well. How's, uh, how's everything on your end, Jer? Um, Good. Things Good. here are beginning to pick up a little bit. Obviously, you can tell from my hair. Got a was able to get a haircut, much needed haircut after four months of not having one. So that was uh, refreshing. It looks like you got the ears yeah, lumped yeah. well. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Little bit. Low fade there. Uh, what are you What are you drinking today, Jer? Ah, so since I believe right when we started the uh, more video series, I just brewed uh, a batch of beer. Today's yeah. the day where it's coming out. Oh. Uh, so this is the Boyd uh, triple uh, bourbon barrel uh, porter. Uh, nice. So I use three different bourbons. Bullet. Uh, Bullet's like more select series. I can't yep. remember exactly what it was. Basil yep. Hayden and Bibbon Tucker as a recommendation from you. Yep. Uh, so it was, they marinated some wood uh, chips. Oh, wait, wait, get this on a all right, ready? There oh, it I hope you heard it. Right, so, so I had I have had a couple, pretty much one every night for the last couple of days. Uh, I'm actually thoroughly surprised at how well it came out. Uh, so you can actually you can taste the bourbon uh, if you let it sit in your mouth for a little bit, but um, that's what I'm drinking. I'm gonna rate it because I made it. Yeah. At least, at least a nine point three. At least a nine point three. That was gonna be my question, man. What What's the uh, important rating? So no bias in that rating, by the way. Completely no different. bias. No bias. Yeah. Absolutely would win a medal in a beer Olympics any day of the week. Yeah. But uh, that's what I'm sipping on. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. Again, I'm pretty surprised how it turned out. But uh, what about you, Brandon? Sell that recipe. Um, so actually our call got pushed back a little bit. I had to go pick up a bottle because I'm fresh out here in the office. Uh, no, I don't drink while I'm treating my patients. I have a, I tried something new. Uh, actually I have it right here. Uh, noble Oak. So double Oak bourbon um, with Sherry Oak staves is uh, one I'm giving it a shot. I like it. It's pretty good. It has a little vanilla taste to it. Um, so I'm giving it a go and I'll have more feedback for you as I uh, continue to drink it. Nice, nice. One day you'll have to start doing a rating system of your own. Once you... Yeah, yeah. I'm not, not quite <laughs> as eclectic as you are. <laughs> One day we should just have drinking and then just start to have a tasting contest and see how it goes. Yeah, when it comes to whiskey, that's like, you know, seven, seven tastes and I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Man. yeah, that's why I stick with beer. But um, yeah, let's start talking about... Um, Tennis elbow, uh, it's something I guess we pretty much uh, across the board all treat uh, in orthopedics. Uh, something that uh, can be pretty challenging for a lot of clinicians. I know the overall prognosis uh, for tennis elbow is good, but tends to take a long time. Um, and we have to, you know, relay that to, to our clients. But is there something that we're not doing and not getting them better quick enough. Um, I know early on for me, I would uh, pretty much mash, smash, uh, you know, tear up those common extensor muscles, uh, you know, and then uh, pretty much, you know, load up with these centrics and kind of hope for the best. Uh, well, I can't say. That's what we're taught in school, though, right? Eccentrics. Huh? So that's what we're taught in school, though. Crush fish and massage and eccentrics. Yep, that, that combo. Um, I guess what the Syriax kind of approach to certain things. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I believe certain people were, were getting better and maybe some people did get better. Um, I would say it was probably a higher dropout because it wasn't, again, the most comfortable thing. And it is a bit of a long tr journey if you kind of go in that route. Um, and again, it was very focused that maybe elbow and rest. Uh, I don't think I really did much uh, beyond that. But um, I don't know if you had any, uh, you know, things that you did anything differently there, Brandon, but I was kind of summed up my unfortunate start to my tennis elbow treating days. Yeah, I'll um, actually, as we were talking about, you know, preparing 
for this, uh, this podcast. I, I remember one patient in particular, um, and I think like you, I, I, I kind of treated the same and you have you know, mixed results. Some get better, some get don't. And you just kind of tell your patient, you know, it's, uh, it's going to take time, you know, you know, headed for a, a long course here. Um, but that's kind of before we, uh, learned what we knew or, or knew what we learned there. And that's, you know, later to come in the show, but I had just one patient, I remember he was a UPS worker, had tennis elbow, and this was back when we were allowed to dry needle, and I was just drawing needle in the shit out of this poor guy, just thinking back to it. Um, and I wasn't even stimming him, which is actually much more tolerable and comfortable, so I was trigger pointing him. And uh, I remember it was like three or four sessions, and there was really no relief, and I was like, you know, what am I missing? Um, I was frustrated. I was like, all right, this isn't working. Um, I think... I think he ever fell off there. This was also around the time I was leaving the company I was formerly with. So um, it, was, it was in that round. But I remember just not getting the results I wanted after only four sessions. Um, like, and, and, you know, I did test, retest. And that stood out to me as I reflected as we prepared for the show because, you know, I think most of us focus at the site of pain um, we're taught to do, you know, soft tissue massage, ART, release techniques, cupping, you know, Graston. whatever soft tissue, uh, uh, ASTEM, is that what you said? Yeah, Graston. Yeah, ASTEM. Graston, ASTEM, whatever. Some type of soft tissue to that area. You even, you know, we'll do some stripping or, or whatever to that area. You might load it. Um, maybe if, if uh, you're probably a more advanced clinician, you're doing some mobilization with movement to the radial head or to the elbow joint in general. Um, you know, we all have done some eccentrics with them. You even have them do pronation, supination, which honestly makes no sense. I've seen people with like a long lever bar or, or weight or something doing pronation, supination for tennis elbow. And it really makes no sense if you think about it because tennis elbow doesn't affect the supinators or the pronator group. Um, other than the fact that maybe you're working on some gripping there, but you know, that was a case that stood out in frustration. And as we were talking, I, I have some patients now where my, po my approach is totally different and I don't really even treat the elbow anymore. Uh, we're just treating the neck. So uh, before I share my thoughts on that, what are your thoughts on treating the neck? How has your um, treatment evolved, Jer? Um, do you always treat the neck first? Or are you just going right to it? Do you assess it? Uh, I guess kind of where, where have you thought, do you even do exercise anymore? Or, or if you do, are your exercises geared towards gripping or are you doing something else? Um, yeah, I still do exercise. Um, I don't know. And that's something that was, I guess, challenged me in residency. It was a client of mine uh, that was that case study that presented CSM. And I remember one of the faculty was like, did you need to do any exercises? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a physical therapist. It's, it's in their name. Do something physical at least. And they're like, really? Did you, did you really need to do it? I'm like, and I was like, I come to think, I was like, did any of those exercises really like do anything great for them? I was like, no, it's really actually the, just the hands-on technique, the education, and you're off on your own. Yeah. Um, yeah, it really depends on the where the, the client's at in their, uh, if it's like a really chronic case and there's been a lot of like compensations and those sort of things, then yeah, I'm definitely implementing more exercises, trying to get them more independent with those sort of things. Uh, but yeah, going back to your first question of, you know, where do you start or do you treat the neck and those sort of things. I start now just overall of experience and everything like that is treat, you know, more proximal to distal now. Um, a lot of our issues very far down the chain, even like wrist. Wrist, I barely do anything with the wrist now. Uh, maybe a couple of quick mobilizations or quick manipulations and I feel most of wrist issues or neck and you know maybe some neural tension and those sorts of things so um, I typically kind of branch out get most of my bang for my buck by treating like the most proximal source which would be you know the cervical thoracic region mm. and then, you know scapular thoracic and then uh, you know if those aren't really you know you know, really hammering home, then, you know, start implementing some stuff. I do remember, um, as part of our residency, I believe it was Scott, uh, Scott Burns mentioned it is, you know, he brought up these kind of ideas and I was at the time where I was just, again, smashing elbows, um, you know, you know, grass and whatever it may be in, um, where I was like, okay, I think I, I think I had a, 
cubal tunnel syndrome case at that time. And I was like, okay, started doing some things at the cervical thoracic junction. And that was money. That was, and even the client was like, that's the best thing you've done for me. All, you know, therapy. So I started like going crazy with it. Um, I mentioned, he did mention, you know, Scott mentions like, you know, you still want to do something towards the elbow, whether, you know, addressing impairments, but more also, you know, keeping with patient buying. Uh, it's, it's tough sometimes for clients to really see that, that kind of link between the cervical thoracic region or scapular region and their elbow pain. Um, you know, a lot, I think it's more, I get more experience. I don't have to have that conversation as much or I don't have to pitch it. It's like, okay, I'm doing this. You see how better you get, but I'm still going to work on your elbow. Um, yeah. now it's like, damn, you made such an impact doing some other stuff. Yeah. I'm not even going to question whether the fact that you haven't really done much with my elbow or wrist or anything like that. But some things, you know, if I see like, you know, sometimes you see like a loss of extension or maybe some wrist extension, I'll do some techniques at the, at the wrist. Um, or if a client, you know, usually, especially by the time they get to you, they're a chronic, you know, tennis elbow individual. They probably have had some therapy or chiropractic or massage therapy and report that, you know, you know, some soft tissue or those sort of things may have helped them in the past. I'll do it, but no, I'm not doing that long anymore. Uh, so that's kind of how I evolved. And again, I'm trying to weed that out as soon as I can. Oh, almost trying to like start to forget about it. But like I'll be doing some other things. I'm like, oh, we're good. And then in my mind, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah we're, we're not doing that unless they report. Like, oh, can you work on that spot? Then, you know, I'll give them the time of day for it. But uh, that's kind of me. What about you there, Brandon? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm still evolving, I would say. You know, it's not – I have it down pat. Obviously, as you said, you have to also treat the impairments and can't just run straight to the neck. But uh, what I've incorporated into my treatment and to kind of help with that buy-in, I have a, a handheld dynamometer. Um, or pain pressure threshold, I should say, uh, gauge. And I put it on, you know, the left elbow, the right, or the intact elbow and the involved elbow um, so they could see the difference. Um, and then uh, I, I do it on the neck. So actually I have a story of a patient I'm treating now came in with some tennis elbow. Um, and in the past he responded very well to just some, some general, uh, I did some MWMs, you know, mobilization movements to his elbow, to his radio head, manipped his neck, manipped his T-spine, and he was good in a couple sessions. Um, but this time it seems to, you know, you know, a year later, you know, back to doing what he's doing, it, it seems to um, have come back. And I did the same, same type of thing, and it got eh, a little better, but I was like, all right, it's clearly there. This seems to be more deep-rooted. You know, this is the second time it's coming back. What else are we missing? Um, definitely asked him a history, you know, any neck injuries, landing strains, you know, anything you could think of. And, you know, he, um, I don't want to say he left it on purpose, but we just didn't think it was related. Um, he was in a car accident 20 years ago. Um, and you know, he didn't think cause he had, uh, no symptoms of his neck. It wasn't warranted or, or him telling me it wasn't warranted. So I, I asked him even further. I'm like, well, what'd you have? Did you have any shoulder pain, elbow pain, anything like that? And he was like, yeah, my shoulder like killed him for uh, like a week. And he's like, it went away. Um, I was like, well, did you get MRIs? Did you get any imaging done? He's like, no, I told him I had shoulder pain. He just said it was uh, bursitis or impingement and it'll go away. He was young at the time. He was in his twenties. So yeah, go, you know, your body heals at a credible rate when you're 24. So it went away. So I'm like, all right, you know, where on the shoulder was it? You know, basically hallmark impingement kind of showed that C5, C6 uh, area. So I started treating his neck um, more focally and not just kind of doing a manip, um, which addresses it and gets you better. But I want it to be more specific. Um, and that C5, C6 area seemed to, to get him better. Um, you know, transitioning, we were doing some exercises and he's like, yeah, it's better. But you know, once we get to a certain way, it, it comes back. I'm like, all right, so that's under load. What, what's happening here? So I, for some reason I, I wanted to just palpate and I gently applied some pressure to his, his left side of uh, C5 and literally bent him in half, like literally his knees buckled. And he's like, what'd you just do? I'm like, I literally touch you with this amount of pressure. And I, I showed him on his arm. He's like, what's that about? So we did pain pressure threshold, left side, right side. Left side was about six pounds of pressure. Right side was uh, almost 20 pounds of pressure. So significant difference. Um, that's where we left off our last session. And that's kind of where we're 
we're going uh, towards next time. So showing him the, the pain pressure threshold was able to see where he was limited. Because to him, he's like, I don't have pain. I just have some neck stiffness, neck tightness. Um, mm -hmm. And I was able to link it back to an old injury he had that he didn't think, you know, was the cause of it. So, uh, again, kind of all signs pointing towards uh, the neck in that case. And um, we have some articles here I want to share in a little bit. But that's kind of, you know, my evolution there. And I want to share the articles that I have that has got me there. But what, uh, what research, I guess, do you use other than anecdotes um, to kind of point you in the right direction for you, Jer? Yeah, I'll, I'll pop up some of those. Uh, but, yeah, I wanted to kind of piggyback about what you were saying. What he said um, is I feel like all the clients is they always say, whether they're looking at like lower extremity issues or maybe in this case, upper extremity issues, they always have a stiff neck. That's what they always say. That's a classic verbatim. Each client will say, oh, my neck is always stiff. Um, me personally, I, I thank God I don't have too many issues or anything like that. I don't normally feel like my neck is just chronically stiff, but these individuals will always say, oh yeah, my neck is always stiff and they blow it off. Like I'm going over past medical history and those sort of things. And no one brings that up until you ask that question. Hey, is there anything you know going on with your neck or anything like that? And they're like, no, just it's always stiff or something like that. Um, something that was good about you know one of my mentors. Um, I think he got it from the script or EIM training or something of that nature. Um, was part of their his examination process was um, especially earlier on was. You literally would just go through the body chart, but then following that would just, you know, touch the client, be like, any problems here, any problems there, and literally touch both sides of both joints, um, touch the neck and those sort of things. But like that way it can kind of funnel people and be like, oh yeah, you know, back 10 years ago, I, you know, tore my hip labrum or something. Well, that wasn't good to know. Be surprised how many people miss out on things, but yeah, be on the lookout for those individuals that say that chronically stiff neck. Um, but um, I, I I regress there. Um, back to some articles and those sort of things. I know Brandon, you have a lot of the articles that I use uh, with like Cleland and you know treating the cervical spine. Uh, some different ones that I kind of use. Really start especially because I started treating. A lot of the overhead athletes and CrossFit athletes and those sort of things of, you know, stop really, you know, hammering home just the elbow, um, but kind of looking at more the scapular thoracic uh, region. Let me see. I got to get better at multiple participants, share screen. This is a great article um, that kind of proves that, you know, a lot of these individuals, I would say even more so in individuals, uh, you know, with who are performing overhead athletics, um, just kind of assessing just pure scapular muscle performance. Uh, so they look at a variety of different tests uh, using a handheld dynamometer, more for strength, not for pain pre pressure threshold. Um, uh, they also looked at ultrasound imaging, scapular muscle endurance. And if you kind of scroll down here, there's a significant difference between, um, you know, the involved and the uninvolved in these, in these clients, uh, mostly, you know, improved strength and endurance on, uh, on the uninvolved. Uh, and me, even before I got to this article, once I started kind of that regional independence approach and started looking kind of above, um, I just see it just in the MMTs again, it's not the best, uh, you know, test that we have, but I can always tell like, you know, if I'm really trying to be unbiased and not trying to, you know, see what I want to see and just try and test things, um, they always kind of cave with these MMTs. So just try and, and then tying into things of like previous um, articles that we discuss of how uh, potentially doing some spinal manipulations can enhance or cause more activation of the lower trap. Uh, you know, I kind of believe that, you know, when we do either mobilizations, manipulations, or some sort of thing that has that neurophysiological effect and get that excitation going, we can get those muscles going. I've played around with it some 
lumbar manipulations with people who have had kind of sleepy glutes and glute amnesia and all of a sudden, you know, doing some bridges that are always hamstring, 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 and all of a sudden they're feeling their glutes, hip mm. thrusters or all those sort of things. So tying all these kind of different articles together, um, you know, I'll do some manipulations and then start doing their, you know, scapular strengthening. Um, and that, you know, definitely helps them out again, especially in the active clientele, you know, it's one thing if you have a desk worker who's got tennis elbow from just typing too much and all that sort of crap, maybe that's not so important, but you know, over athletics and those sort of things, this is pretty important. You know, you need all these muscles for pitching, throwing, over lifting. But, um, what about you there, Brandon? Uh, this article just oh, before is scapular muscle performance in individuals with lateral epicondalgia epicondalgia by a day at all just for those listening at home yeah it's a it's a great article i would even say you know those patients who sit at a desk probably need it more because in, in okay. a different and i just want to say this to tie things together for the audience um you know their periscapular muscles are, are probably weaker their mid trap is is weaker their rhomboids are weaker they probably have some stretch sure. weakness going on um uh, upper cross syndrome um, you know, by Vladimir Yanda, their upper traps probably aren't even that strong. Uh, they may be tight because they're holding on, but they're not probably strong. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think they need it for a different reason. While an overhead athlete, they need to be balanced. Um, they're generating a lot of torque. Um, you know, and if they don't have the stress, the strength here, are they, you know, getting from it up here and jamming up their neck? Um, so I would say there, there's, you know, different reasons why people might do it, but they may still need it and i i mean my exercises now i do less and less eccentrics because especially for the patients that have neck pain or it's largely stemming from the neck um eccentrics isn't gonna do anything uh, i want to work on that yeah, i think it's gonna piss work. things off more yeah exactly because they're they're trying to load an area that they can't stabilize proximally and i think you talked about how you move more from a more distal approach to more proximal approach and, and that's what it comes that doing periscapular work um, or working on their neck with their exercises is, you know, that proximal um, approach that you need to for that top-down effect, um, if that makes sense for, for everybody out there. I don't know if you want to add to that part before I go into my articles, but yeah. No, no, I, I, I agree, and uh, it's a good way to look at it, you know. Um, those individuals are probably overstretching their mid, you know, scapular muscles, um, so... Yeah, good, good point there, Brandon. But yeah, go ahead and talk about your articles. So I'll, I'll touch upon the Cleveland ones where they talk about the neck in, in a little bit. I have two other ones that are that are favorites of mine here. Um, let's see. We got this guy. So this is by Berglund. And uh, I mean, a lot of this talks about, uh, I'll just kind of highlight what I have have highlighted here. And th this is stuff that stood out to me when I was reading it. 70% um, of subjects with uh, lateral elbow pain have an involvement at the cervical and thoracic spine compared to, you know, the control group, um, which only have 16%. So, I mean, that's huge. That's more than half. If I was a betting man, if you go to, uh, if you go to Vegas with 70% odds that you're going to win, I, I'd take those, that, uh, that line any day. Yeah. Um, you know, coming over to here, uh, I think, too much we think of nociceptive mechanisms and things like that but we need to look at that somatic referred pain pattern and we've talked about that many times on this show um you know looking at the neck and t-spine radial nerves uh and you know going down to central sensitization or pain pressure pain pressure threshold um some things to look at if you don't have a a, a handheld dynamometer i mean you can roughly try and use, you know, your own pressure, um, maybe mobilizations, different grades, uh, P1, P2, R1, R2, for, you know, Maitland approach there using, uh, you know, grade two, three, four, four plus, four plus plus sustained glides. Maybe you could use that in your evaluation. Um, here they talk about changes in skin temperature and tolerance to that. And that's because of that sensor sensitization um, or, or uh, pain pressure threshold that's altered because of the pain. I mean, all this stuff, like you said, you tie it in together or you've begun to tie in multiple articles. One article says this, another article says this, and you tie it together. Um, Vincent Zeno has, you know, some great articles talking about 
cervical spine and the hypoalgesia effects and excitatory effects, which you touched upon there. Um, now, this really ties that all together, uh, that article. Uh, another article I like, and the title is perfect, is uh, by Coombs, I believe, in 2015. Hmm. Is that up yet, or is that my, my Yeah, you're good. You're good. Uh, now, the Berglund article. It's a good I article. I apologize. Um, so the Coombs was up. Oh, Coombs was up. On my side, it showed Berg. But... No, yep, Coombs is up. Oh, you want to know why? Because Zoom lets you just pick an article, but I'm still looking at whatchamacallit. All right. So Coombs in the 2015, yeah, management of lateral um, tennis elbow or uh, elbow tendinopathy. You know, this whole article basically talks about your assessment should look at other things. It should, you should look at the neck. You should look at differential diagnosis, assess, um, you know, intra-articular pathology, uh, assess uh, the radial nerve and median nerve. Um, mm -hmm. you know, different types of treatment. So your treatment is going to be guided by your evaluation and your impairments that you find. So we're not saying to just jump to the neck. Obviously, you know, what we've seen, we've able been able to kind of deduce and be like, all right, we need to assess the neck. But this is a great article that gives you um, great perspective on what you should be looking for in, uh, in your assessment and in your treatment paradigms. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll just show the, the Cleland article. This is his 2005 one talking about treating uh, the cervical thoracic region. Uh, let me close that there. So yeah, incorporation of manual therapy directed toward cervical thoracic uh, spine in patients with uh, LE. This is a pilot uh, study. Um, so they looked at that and showed obviously promising results there. And then for time's sake, I don't want to dive into all of these, but just to show everybody that's out there and they can, you know, we'll link these uh, articles like we always do into the, the show notes. But effectiveness of manual therapy uh, to the C-spine in management of LE, and this is a re retrospective analysis. So there's plenty of evidence looking at the upper quarter region, um, treating the neck, treating the T-spine, doing some neurodynamics, uh, things like that. Uh, exercise wise, uh, I even have incorporated a lot of shoulder shrugs now. Um, and I make sure I kind of do it in more of a, a diagonal. And since everybody can see, I'll kind of come here. Most people will probably shrug like this where at the gym, I'm going to shrug up and back. If you can kind of see that and it kind of goes to the, the occiput of my head and you know, the upper trap goes, you know, attaches all the way up to the nuchal line in the head. It, it stabilizes and supports um, the cervical spine all the way up. So maybe people with tight traps all the time don't need to be stretched. They need to be strengthened more. Uh, and mm -hmm. I've had some really good success uh, focusing on some proper shoulder shrugs. I'm not focusing on weight, but focusing on, on control and movement pattern. And that with the manual therapy I've been doing, people have had a lot of good results um, with that instead of just doing DNF. I mean, I think DNF gets run into the ground. Um, maybe people are, aren't doing them, but I, I felt like there was a ceiling effect with that. Um, and I've also incorporated some joint position error with the laser. Um, uh, I know we've talked about that before on our show, but that kind of pretty much sums up what, uh, what I do for, uh, my tennis elbow patients. It, it's a lot of regional, uh, treatments. And I know this probably sounds a little bit similar from our regional interdependence, uh, topic and uh, show we did. But, um, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of what we're doing here. Yeah. Uh, and then to go off top of that, and those articles mentioned it a lot, is, uh, you know, doing neural dynamics, radial nerve. How often is, you know, people's classic, they've been to, you know, countless of different providers and, you know, it's always tennis elbow, tennis elbow. Uh, they even say it's inflamed or whatever it may be, uh, probably from all the scraping. But, um, you know, how often is it, you know, either radial nerve or posterior, you know, interosseous nerve, um, you medium know, nerve. median nerve, um, all those sort of things can, you know, be masking, especially radial nerve, can be masking lateral epicondalgia. Uh, and then treating, you know, I, I probably have my best success and with any nerve related stuff by doing more, you know, proximal based treatments of, you know, mobilization manipulations to the 
in this case, a C, uh, cervical and thoracic spine. Uh, so um, a lot of that, I've been given a lot of neurodynamics with that. Um, and that's, you know, you know, clients will start to be like, you know, what really helps is, you know, start doing those radial glides and those sort of things. So yeah. um, that's something that's commonly missed. Um, we just assume anything that's, you know, pain in this area is, yeah. Know, so, so, um, some, um, real quick, some other things yeah, I'm yeah. talking about neurodynamics. And uh, for those of you who could draw a needle still in your states, um, and maybe even those who can't draw a needle, because you're probably, if you don't draw a needle, you might not even be uh, familiar with the referred pain patterns, but the supraspinatus and infraspinatus um, refer right down to the, um, the lateral elbow. Uh, I had a golfer once I was treating, um, and you know, she had elbow pain and obviously in a sport like golf, you're gripping a lot. So we, we looked at the, the wrist and, and elbow first. Um, but we were, as we worked our way up, we, we found that some of her pain was, uh, coming from that inferent supraspinatus, we did some dry needling um, to it and uh, it cleared on up. Um, I would also recommend looking at the multifidi of those segments in the cervical spine, C5, C6, C7. Uh, I mean, all those nerve roots um, create the median and or radial nerve as well. So if there's some compression or some hypertonicity or trigger points in the multifidi addressing those areas, you're gonna be able to uh, relieve that pain as well. Uh, so just uh, some other tidbits for you guys out there. Yeah, so that's a lot of a lot of different and great interventions that many of us are Diagnosis is key. Yeah, yeah, uh, that is you know I again as we talk in our shows and everything like that, I think that is the ultimate key is you know honing in on your differential diagnosing. So, mm. um, well, anything specific that you see in your examination in the or subjective there brandon that you would say hey you know that kind of clues you in especially let's say you have someone with direct access who just says that they have elbow pain uh what was the last part you said what about direct access uh, let's say you had someone direct access which i know you have a ton of um yeah. comes in just says elbow pain anything that's like all right that is um you know yeah. Uh, for me, I'm going to the neck. That's the first thing. And I've, I'm, I'm obviously going to listen to them. Um, you know, you take your subjective. I ask my questions. I, I really try and double down on the neck. I, I think that's, uh, you know, somebody comes in, they're, they're so, um, you know, frustrated, anxious, uh, stressed, whatever about their elbow. They could probably only perseverate on their elbow. Um, mm. And I, I just start, I always start my, my screen with the neck. I ask them, move it. Um, actively, I add overpressure. Um, I add overpressure and combined range of motions. I'll do my P to A's. Um, I focus on my unilateral P to A's now, literally yeah. down each segment um, uh, and left and right because you do it on the involved side and you're like, no, it's fine. I'm like, all right, let's see how you, you compare it to the other side. And then that's usually when they notice the difference when they're like, oh, I didn't realize that that side was that sensitive. Mm -hmm. Or and I think we've, you know, anybody can attest to this who's been in some type of pain, especially if you've been an athlete, you're so used to the pain, your body and your brain just gets used to it and learns how to cope with it. And a lot of people I've had say to this after their treatment, they're like, wow, I didn't realize how much pain I was in until I'm not in pain because you've reset that system and now they can kind of breathe. They have less stress, things like that. So, you know, like, like we've talked about a lot of times. Um, I let my assessment slash my intervention within my assessment kind of guide where I'm going, uh, you know, and let the response guide and that tells me where to go. But I'm, I'm always looking at the neck and I think the more and more I'm treating, I keep going back to the spine for a lot of these extremity um, mm -hmm. diagnoses, especially these tendinopathy uh, ones, uh, tendinitis uh, diagnoses. Uh, and I think we're going to have another show uh, talking about uh, tendinopathies as a whole, Achilles, uh, patella, tendinitis, you know, shoulder, um, uh, was it bicipital tendinopathies? Um, mm -hmm. Are there really tendinopathies or is it just getting this um, umbrella term and we need to really double down on, on something? And I think actually, Jerry, we were talking, I'll, I'll give credit um, to you as um, I think over the past few weeks, I've even doubled down even more on on it because you had told me something your uh teacher toko slash mentor at your fellowship had said to you and i've heard this before but you know i think we all need a refresher 
Uh, somebody's gotten better. You did an intervention, they got better. Let's say they got 80% better. Instead of just leaving it there and, and you know, writing it off to exercises, what else can you pinpoint and try and find? So I think and I heard that from you. Um, and I was like, let me, let me go back and, and kind of do another, another sweep through on, you know, my assessment in certain areas. Um, and I've been cleaning up uh, a lot of things that were, were missed, though. You know, I was, thought I was going, doing a good job and probably was, but, you know, I yeah. want to show that we can all do better. Yeah, that was when he, I think we, or I think it might have been a virtual round, and we, he said, you know, based off of what we were doing, he's like, yeah, you might have gotten them 80, 85% better. He's like, what else? I'm like, it's day one. It's not bad. It's a good start. Yeah. And that's that next, you know, that's that being superior is, you know, you know, you know 80, 85%, you know, that's going to get most people to buy in, but nothing like making, you know, blowing, you know, blowing people's minds away by taking it to the next level. And yeah, you, you said right on, you know, said right with the, you know, unilateral UPAs. Um, I find that a lot of the times is, you know, people have no idea. And then it's also on tender, hypermobile um, in those areas. Um, I'm starting to, with my fellowship, get a little bit more into lateral glides, you know, assessing for, you know, you know, segmental mobility and those sort of things. I think um, with a lot of the research of like manual therapy, I was non-specific initially. I kind of just took that for granted. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, you know, the difficulty in really truly assessing one level to the other is, you know, it's very challenging. But now I've been going back and been like, no, I can really actually tell a difference if I really take the time to um, and, and those things, that's when I can really start actually making a lot of improvements if I start being more and more specific. So, um, yeah, it's all for my patient's benefits. Again, you you can get them better, you know, by being non-specific, but it's how quickly can you get them better? Is it going to take six sessions or can it be done in one to two? So, yeah, I, I think, you know, hearing you, what you've been going through and obviously my experiences and I, I think that's, Hopefully in a few years, obviously everyone, you know, our profession goes in these massive pendulum swings and, you know, it's coming off of the anti-manual therapy and anti, or uh, not anti, but anti-manual therapy and pain science. And all you have to do is educate. It's, you know, how much of this stuff was missed or even with manual therapy. And, and you know, I can attest to this. Oh, it's non-specific. So you kind of go in and, and maybe you, you, like you said, took for granted or maybe didn't. Uh, deep dive further uh, enough into it because you're like, all right, it's not specific. I'm getting it. I'm addressing it. But mm -hmm. um, and you try and actually be more specific uh, with some of this stuff and incorporate it with um, the physiology and neurophysiological effects of manual therapy to get those changes specifically, um, though they're non-specific, and incorporate that with some patient education. Which patient education is pain science. Pain science is patient education. I think that delineation needs to. Um, be made and not be separated out um mm -hmm. you know and how can we use everything together uh and not instead of isolating everything uh, apart um so i think you know hearing some of the stuff you've been going through and just reflecting uh on my experiences um i think we need to be a little bit more specific with our treatment and not just um chalk it up to you know exercise every day that's a low-hanging fruit sleep every day you know that helps mm -hmm. but it's not the end all be all no, I mean, those are, those are all things people can probably figure out and probably everyone knows it. Every sleep conversation I've ever had, every exercise and proper nutrition conversation I've ever had, the clients are like, yeah, yeah, I know. Literally that whole sort of, yeah, but they need more than that. They're coming to you for more than that. Uh, they're, I mean, hell, the eccentrics and that sort of stuff, that's all online. Um, they're coming for you for more of a change and more of an immediate change. Yeah, uh, that's what a, I think you hit it. Immediate change. There we go. Everybody wants that quick fix pill. How do you that's... give them that quick fix pill other than just coaching them to go exercise, which I'm not saying we shouldn't do, but you, you need no, to be should... more than just a, a fitness coach here. Yeah, and how much of those individuals are just 
preach those things, exercise them. Oh yeah, I fixed that person. Yeah, you probably, yeah. How was your follow up? Did that person really get to, you know, full results quickly? And that's the thing. Yeah, a lot of these things will spontaneously get better. It's how quickly they're going to get better, and how little of the rest of the medical, I guess, society or expenses are they actually going to use? Are they going to go get a cortisone injection, which is not really effective? Um, are yeah. they, you know, yeah. Gonna, are they going to stop doing what they want to do and those sort of things? So, um, you know, our clients deserve more from us and we have that expertise and knowledge. We need to give it to them. Um, so, um, but yeah, I guess that's a good, uh, good rant to yeah, wrap things up on. <laughs> um, I hope you guys all enjoyed it. Uh, if you had any questions or anything like that, uh, need mentorship, um, you know, have a case study or anything like that, feel free to reach out to us at Manips and Sips on uh, Instagram and Facebook. Uh, we're also, I'm at The Decent Doctor and that Traffic and Therapeutics. Brandon's at Pursue PT Now and Think Like a Fellow. I don't know, Brandon, you want to talk about some new upcoming yeah. things? So we have time uh, for that. We've, re we've recently launched uh, our manual therapy mentorship. It it's virtual. Uh, Jeremy is uh, obviously joining me in this endeavor, as well as uh, one of our other friends who's in Virginia, uh, Dr. Kyle Feldman. Um, so basically, it's a platform where we've created, which is a uh, um, residency and fellowship based uh, or, or style learning and level learning. Uh, not everybody has uh, uh, access or is fortunate enough to have the time or funds or means to do a residency or fellowship, but we've uh, created a platform uh, for, uh, only $30 a month right now, uh, it will go up. So if you're interested, um, definitely hop on it now, but we have uh, virtual calls twice a month to talk about, um, patient cases, uh, research, uh, professional topics, even business development as all three of us are business owners and can, uh, kind of help point you in the right direction. We have a private Facebook group where we can, uh, have, uh, threads of discussions, uh, again, on, uh, patient management, um, cases, professional topics and the like, uh, as well as uh, just under 100 manual therapy videos with step-by-step uh, -step instructions. And uh, that's uh, only going to be added to uh, in the future. So that can be uh, found on um, my website, uh, pursuptnow.com, uh, or check out, I, I don't know, if Jeremy, if you put it in your link, but it's in my link um, and my bio link on Instagram at Think Like a Fellow or Pursue PT Now. Um, we also have courses coming up, in-person courses in the fall. Uh, our first one is a one-day uh, extremity manual therapy course. Uh, so that's a, a fun, quick course uh, to get into. We'll have some PPE available for everybody um, who's concerned, obviously, with uh, uh, COVID, and we need to be uh, safe and healthy first. Um, and then we also have uh, a lumbar uh, management course down at Jeremy's uh, clinic, his uh, nice new clinic in Glassboro. And then our um, end of the year course, which has been a hit for the past three years of uh, spinal manipulation. So that's kind of what we have uh, slated for the next uh, six months. Yeah, super excited for all that. Um, a lot of good, great stuff. Uh, thanks for pioneering all that there, Brandon. Uh, definitely look into the, uh, the virtual stuff. And then, you know, as always, it's always fun to get your hands and learn some new techniques in person. So uh, feel free to reach out to us about those courses. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And uh, cheers. All right. Cheers, guys.